Hi everyone, my name is Irene D, and today I'll be giving a talk on the new differentiable programming framework we're developing at Facebook. I'm giving this talk today on behalf of my wonderful team. So here is everyone's smiling faces. All right, so what is differentiable programming? Well, differentiable programming brings gradient-based optimization techniques from machine learning into general programming. With machine learning, many algorithms are now being learned instead of explicitly written by programmers. And in the words of Jan LeCun, it's really very much like a regular program, except it's parameterized, automatically differentiated, and trainable or optimizable. Of course, there are many popular frameworks that do provide differentiation, such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX. However, these frameworks are heavily geared towards traditional machine learning models, and there are many use cases that are not well supported, such as computer graphics, physics simulations, and probabilistic programming. So let's take a look at what we need to cover these other use cases. First, we'll need a fast language to write computationally intensive code wherever it is needed. So most popular frameworks today use Python as a surface language, which makes it inefficient to write custom logic. And of course, we'll need automatic differentiation so users can obtain the gradients of their computations automatically. Next, we'll need memory safety, as it can be difficult and frustrating to track down memory issues when you have other goals in mind. Type safety can also be very helpful, especially when writing large programs. And finally, static compilation enables many useful optimizations before runtime. So with that in mind, in the end, it all comes down to performance, usability, and flexibility. It's important that users are able to write performant code that can be productionized easily and works well with mixed workload applications. On the usability side, users should be able to effectively develop and iterate on new models. Debugability, for example, is a huge necessity. Bugs should be quickly surfaced and easily understood. With regards to flexibility, our framework can be applied to a wide range of use cases. Most frameworks work exceptionally well on certain use cases, like traditional machine learning models. But once you step outside those boundaries and are writing custom code, you quickly lose out on usability and performance. To address these three major needs, we have taken a compiler-aware approach. We provide a customizable, extensible API that serves as the base toolkit for differentiability and building ML models. On top of that, we provide compile time optimizations and compile time shape checking enabled through compiler plugins. So why Kotlin? Well, we decided on Kotlin because it's, it's easy to use, it's memory safe, it's type safe, and they're fun functional constructs. Uh, it's extensible via compiler plugins and it's performant. Kotlin is a JVM language, which means that it can be anywhere from half the speed of C++ to sometimes faster than C++, and of course, orders of magnitude faster than Python. Kotlin is developed by JetBrains, who is also the creator of the popular IDE, IntelliJ. As a result, Kotlin has excellent seamless IDE support, which is crucial for developers. And so you might be wondering, why are we using an Android language? Well, actually, there is a talk today happening uh, called Kotlin is way more than just Android. Kotlin, while it is the official Android language, can be used for a wide variety of other applications, like server-side applications, writing DSLs. JetBrains even has a dedicated team of developers that are working on Kotlin for data science. For example, they're working on notebook support. Furthermore, Kotlin's interoperability with Java gives it access to the entire Java ecosystem, which includes numerous popular libraries. In addition to the JVM, Kotlin can also target native, LLVM, or JavaScript. With these other two backends, Kotlin can be used not only just for Android 
and of course all the other applications as we discuss, but also for iOS and web programming. Kotlin is a well-loved language with an active developer community and millions of users, and we firmly believe that Kotlin is the perfect language for compiler-aware differentiability. So now let's take a look at our API. Our API is pure and functional, which means that, it, that the values we work with are immutable. This gives us performance and usability advantages. Our API supports both scalar and tensor math. For example, in this slide, we have a function f that's equivalent to sine. To compute the first derivative, you pass the value at which you're evaluating the derivative x and a reference to the function you are taking the derivative of. In this example, the function fp, which is the derivative of f, is approximately equal to cosine. We can support both forward and reverse differentiation. And we can see here that by nesting, we can also compute higher order derivatives. We also support the derivatives of multivariate functions, functions taking or returning user-defined types, or tensor functions. So that's like computing the Jacobian or the Hessian. We also support many other components practically needed for AI applications. Notably, our API provides the necessary tools to tackle traditional ML problems, such as layers and optimizers. In addition, the API is designed to be customizable and extensible. For example, you can differentiate with inputs or outputs being user-defined types. You can also add user-defined trainable layers and components. Finally, our API is designed to be optimizable by a compiler plugin. So now that we've covered the, the different pieces of the API, let's talk about performance. We've talked previously about how Kotlin is performant. This is exciting because it allows differentiability to be used in mixed workload applications. So if you're writing a performance critical application, you can add pieces of differentiation without the cost of having to write logic in Python as you would in other frameworks. For more traditional ML use cases, we've hooked into MKL DNN, the go-to library for machine learning ops on CPU, and continue to work on C++ speedups. We have demonstrated performance on par with other popular frameworks. We also support sparse tensors. Sparse information is everywhere. For example, social network companies like Facebook have a lot of graph type problems, so they have a lot of sparse data. Many frameworks support some sparse tensor operations, but have little to no support for their gradients, which prevents learning on sparse weights. So far, we have seen an order of magnitude performance increase with our sparse tensors. We are also developing a couple of compile time optimizations that work with our library. As mentioned previously, our API is specifically designed for this purpose. So now that we've covered our API, let's take a look at some of the cool compiler optimizations that we're developing. Let's take a look at the first optimization, AD Optimize. Our AD implementation produces a compute tree for evaluating the derivative, which is built at runtime with a node created for each operation. This approach comes at the cost of extra allocations and function calls. This is a common problem in automatic differentiation frameworks. Our AD Optimize plugin addresses this cost by inlining differentiable computations and unboxing scalars. Now let's take a look at an example. So here you can see we have a function foo that computes the geometric series with r is equal to 1 half. We can see here that y is the sum, and in this loop we are accumulating a divided by 2 to the power of i. To compute the derivative, we create a compute tree. Here is what the compute tree looks like for three iterations. Each operation that we do produces a node in our compute tree. The loop of foo is actually running a thousand times. So, in, and in each iteration, we have a couple of operations, add and divide. So we're actually creating approximately a couple thousand node objects here at runtime in order to compute the derivative. 
So how can we do better? Well, with the AD Optimized plugin, we can unbox scalars and inline derivative values in order to drastically reduce the number of objects that we create. For this example, this results in the creation of just one single object for the derivative computation. But we can do even more. So let's take a look at the next optimization, coarsening. Coarsening is a novel optimization technique that we have developed. There are two main ways to do differentiations. There's algorithmic differentiation and there's symbolic differentiation. Algorithmic differentiation differentiates every operation at runtime. It has the finest granularity of operation. Symbolic differentiation applies calculus on the entire computation and has the largest granularity of operation. Coursing introduces a new way to do AD by striking a balance between two existing methods and getting the best of both worlds. With coarsening, the AD optimizer takes the primal code as input, identifies segments of interest through a reuse aware algorithm, raises them to the symbolic level, and conducts symbolic differentiation and generates the optimized code with mixed algorithmic symbolic differentiation. So the key point here is that coarsening has a larger view than our standard differentiation, which allows for more optimizations. Now let's revisit the geometric series function. With coarsening, we're able to consider the entire function's computation and recognize certain patterns. Coarsening can transform loops into summations and even simplify summations further. Here we can use this property of geometric series to simplify the foo function. We can then take the derivative of this simplified function. So here are the functions generated by our coarsening optimization. Here is the primal computation, and over here is the gradient computation. We have arrived at the primal computation through this property here, the one that looks like a screenshot from a textbook, um, and the gradient was computed symbolically from this. We've effectively reduced our function foo to a simple short expression with no loops, and same for the gradient. Also, notice that when we obtain the derivative now, we only call foo grad. Previously, the AD system would actually call the primal function foo behind the scenes. Now we don't have any calls to foo at all, and we can just call foo directly. So now let's take a look at a more complex example. This slide shows the performance of Hokkien Spring, a physics simulation program. It simulates mass spring systems. The three configurations correspond to three sizes of the spring system in terms of the number of spring vertices. So here we have uh, 10 vertices, 20 vertices, and 40 vertices. Coursing is able to do symbolic differentiation on the entire computation of the gradient. As a result, the primal computation, which computes the system energy, can be completely removed. So you can see here that the primal time is actually reduced to zero. And so this is similar to what we saw on the previous example, where we had to only call, or where we only had to call FUGRAD to get the derivative. The speedups here that we have observed are 4 to 11x. The program even runs faster than the original primal computation alone. We've also evaluated coarsening on other examples and have observed speedups of one to two orders of magnitude. So now that we've gone over compiler optimizations for performance, let's see how we're using compiler plugins to enhance usability. Tensors are often fed through many different operations. Each operation often has different shape requirements and produces a new tensor with a possibly different shape. The combination of shape requirements and new output shapes makes it incredibly easy to hit runtime shape errors with popular frameworks, which offer no static shape checking or information. Debugging runtime shape errors is hard, and a lot of users rely heavily on printing their shapes at runtime to debug errors or even to just understand what their code is doing. To address this issue, 
we're developing a compiler plugin for static shape checking. With this plugin, users will get not only compile time shape inference and shape checking, but also real time feedback in IntelliJ, such as error messaging and redlining. With IntelliJ, users can also inspect the shapes of their tensors as they develop, so before they even build or run their code. The plugin is integrated with our API, which means that you can get static shape checking out of the box for numerous tensor operations. And lastly, the plugin functionality is extensible. There are a lot of tensor operations that have complex shape transformations, so it's important that users can define their own shape functions. So here's an example of how you can provide static shape checking for the matmol function, which implements a matrix multiply. For those who are unfamiliar, matmol takes two two-dimensional tensors and requires that the inner two dimensions match. So here we can see that the second dimension of x is the parameter b, and the first dimension of y is the parameter b. Now let's take a look at matmol in action. The shape of a is inferred to be 1, 2, and the shape of b is inferred to be 2, 3. The value res is obtained from a correct usage of matmol that produces a tensor of shape 1, 3. Now, bad res shows an incorrect usage of matmol. This will result in a compile time error as the inner dimensions do not match. Here we have a couple of examples showing what the plugin looks like in IntelliJ. Up top here, we have shape inspection, and over here on the bottom, we have an error message. And remember, this is all happening during development, and this means that users can inspect their code and see errors immediately as they're typing. Now let's take a look at an example of more complex shape checking. The shape of the matmol function was quite simple and could be done using positional matching. However, broadcast is an example of a shape transformation that is not so easily expressed. Broadcast is a very dynamic shape transformation that lets users add tensors of different shapes. Up top, we have the broadcast shape function. Users can write this code imperatively and even call other functions. On the bottom, we have the definition of add. Notice that the return shape is a call to the shape function broadcasts on A and B. This type of extensibility allows users to find custom shape checking logic for new tensor operations. Now that we've gone over all the major components of our framework, let's take a look at an interesting use case. B-Machine is a probabilistic programming system for Bayesian models that is being developed at Facebook. Traditional differentiation and machine learning frameworks were not a good fit for them. In particular, traditional frameworks generally lack higher order differentiation, performance scalar support, sparse tensor support, and fast execution of native language. For example, Newtonian Monte Carlo is a probabilistic inference algorithm algorithm that uses second order differentiation and is well suited for scalars. And so with our framework, we're able to provide support for these use cases, and we're collaborating with Bean Machine to provide the differentiability infrastructure that they need. So I started this talk saying that what we're doing really comes down to performance, usability, and flexibility. Here's how all the pieces we've discussed fit into that idea. So for performance, we saw the benefits from sparse tensors, MKLDNN, being in the Kotlin, and our optimization plugins. With regards to usability, we talked about our functional API and our static shape checking plugin. For flexibility, we saw that our API was extensible and customizable, and we saw how shape checking, the shape checking plugin was extensible as well. We also touched on our collaboration with B Machine, a probabilistic programming system. All right, so what do we have planned for the future? Well, on the optimization side, we want to develop new optimizations enabled by compiler plugins. For example, there might be room for more domain-specific optimizations. And because these are all plugins, users can pick and choose which ones to apply depending on what their goals are. So on the usability front, you can imagine that there is a lot of other metadata out there besides tensor shapes that could be used to help users detect bugs early and ergonomically. 
Lastly, we're excited to see users utilize our framework for their innovative purposes, and we're looking forward to getting their feedback and working with them. All right, so that's all for this talk. Thank you for listening. Excellent talk, Irene. Uh, it's always good to learn uh, about all the new research uh, going on in this area. Um, it definitely gave me some flashbacks to calculus class, which is this minor downside, but you know, it's it's useful. Um, so I'm wondering, so this is a library in Kotlin. Uh, how do you achieve uh, the analysis of the code? Is it like, you, you were talking about compiler plugins, is it like, analyzing and interfering, sort of interspersing uh, itself into the compiler build chain, is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, we have uh, compiler plugins and they run at different levels in, in the plugin. So for example, the static um, shape checking plugin, it, it runs in the front end and one of the things that we're intercepting is call resolution. So that is a big thing, um, right? Because we have to check the different each call and we have to make sure that each call produces the right shape. Um, and then for things like the AD optimized plugin, which is generating code that actually runs further down the compiler pipeline. So that one will run on the Kotlin IR, um, which is right before it gets translated to either uh, JVM bytecode or native or JavaScript. So that's a stat, that's basically a feature of Kotlin, right? You're not doing anything special here. It's just you plug in here, compile it, generate new yeah, yeah. nodes. So, the... Yeah, so we are using the, uh, yeah, we're just using the general Kotlin um, plugin framework. So uh, how many language features do you support? Can I use everything in Kotlin? Can everything be differentiated? Uh, yeah, so. It kind of, it so it depends. I would say that it, not everything can be differentiated, but we provide support in our API to, for our users to add their own custom different, differentiable objects. You would have to um, extend an interface and fit onto our API if you want your custom object to be differentiated. Um, in terms of things like control flow, we are planning to handle that uh, with, with compiler plugins as well. And so that's all built, uh, that's easy for users to do. They don't have to write, the, they, they don't have to write their own plugins. No, yeah, we, we're planning to provide the general features of Kotlin um, for users. And so they can differentiate through, gen generally through most features. Um, yeah, and, and that includes control flow as well. So. Maybe this is a weird question, but what does it mean to differentiate over control flow? Can you maybe talk yeah. about, explain that? Yeah, so to differentiate over control flow, well, so generally it it is, so let's, I guess like to back up, if you are in a framework, let's say like PyTorch and you're different and you have a like an if statement or, you know, for loop, you're actually just tracing through the for loop. Um, and so remember in the talk, we talked about building a compute tree. Um, and so what's happening is every operation that you do in the for loop gets unrolled into this compute tree. And so that's what's happening in, in a framework like PyTorch. Um, for us, that is also happening, but what people actually prefer is to have the control flow preserved so that people so the dyn dynamism is actually preserved uh, later on in our models. So it just so, yeah. In in other frameworks, it just gets unrolled completely, but you lose that the sense that you have control flow, and you also are not able to uh, do optimizations on it because you lose that. Yeah. And I guess you also, if you optimize the control flow away, you can't debug into it. I suppose is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I see some questions in the chat. Maybe we should step back and say, so what do yeah. you use this for? Is this for, is it um, for writing general ML uh, models just in a more language-based way, is that it? 
Yeah, so I would I would say um, I would say like the the other popular frameworks are more suited towards that use case as as we saw in the presentation. Um, so the use cases that we're that we're looking at more are outside of that box. So for example, we did talk about probabilistic programming, and one thing that people tend to use probabilistic programming for um, is things like. Uh, like climate models, there's um, uh, like there, there's like a probabilistic programming model that's used to like make sure gamers are uh, the same. They find gamers at the same level when they pit them against each other. So that that's an example. Another example that you might see differentiable programming used is things like uh, like a ray tracer has, and so physics simulations, things in that area. Well, and it, for that, it's for the ray tracing example. It's used to to optimize the ray tracer or the to, to learn anything about it. Yeah, so I think for the ray tracing ray tracing example, I think I think it's generally used as an optimization, um, but it's also used. I think it's something like you learn. Uh, you learn with respect to the different, um, like, you know, your objects might have like a property to them and you might have a position. And so you're learning with respect to those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you brought up the word probabilistic programming. Yes. Uh, is it too much to ask? Is it a bigger explanation to give an overview of what that is? Yeah, I can I can attempt to give an overview. I'm not just an, an elevator pitch, maybe. If, if yeah, that. yeah. So probabilistic programming is um, basically basically a way to encode uncertainty um, into your models. So if you can think, um, you actually so what happens in probabilistic programming is you provide some sort of assumption about your world. Um, and that might be in the form of distributions. So you provide some sort of statistical assumptions and then you provide some observations on top of that. And so you're, you're basically saying, here's what I think the world, how the world is acting. And then you say, well, this is what I'm seeing. And then you, and then what comes out is a distribution that says, this is what might actually be happening given those two things, the observations and your assumptions. So it allows people to add a level of uncertainty, but also some domain knowledge into uh, their models. Mm -hmm. And I think Facebook does a lot of research into that. I think we had a QCon talk two years ago from your colleague whose name yeah, is Yeah, Michael Tangley. Oh, think yeah, I yeah. That. yeah. So yeah. For, if the audience would like to look at that more, uh, just look for InfoQ probabilistic programming. There's a talk online. Um, let's see, uh, there's a question here. How would Kotlin deal with continuous functions and stochastic calculus? Uh, that's obvious to me, but uh, maybe help everyone else. I'm kidding, this is not obvious to me. Like, you can answer the question. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I guess I, I'm not sure if I quite understand the question here because we would need to have continuous functions in order to take the derivative of them. Um, so, um, yeah, if you if you are writing something that you're taking the derivative with uh, the derivative of, it would need to be a continuous function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you so the differentiation, um, so you gave the example of differentiating um, uh, the sine function, the sine function. Mm -hmm. So how much uh, how fancy can I get with the functions in there? How much do you support if I have like I don't know. I can't think of any fancy functions. Bernoulli, that's not the right, that's not the right thing, but something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can get pretty, pretty fancy. Um, so we, we do have like a suite of examples and also generally you can do any, you, we do support anything traditional machine learning supports as well. So, and those, those models do get, I, I guess, pretty fancy too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we also had the question of, so is this open source? Is this online? Are you going to open source it? Can people play around this with this somewhere? 
Right, that, that's a great question. So we are working on open sourcing our framework and that is the plan. Um, right now we're currently uh, getting feedback internally and we have some internal users, but we have we don't have any concrete plans to open source soon. Okay. I think, uh, did you work with Eric Meyer directly? Yeah, so Eric Meyer actually started this team and he was, yeah, and so we worked together in the beginning when the team I, was I saw some tweets over the last year or two with him doing stuff with math and Kotlin. I thought, what's, what's he up to? How, how, yeah, many, so how, many monads, how many monads does he force you to use? Or how many what? How many monads? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, working, yeah, working with Eric is, is quite interesting. It is also quite interesting to um, definitely work in the intersection of machine learning and PLs, because I think there is, there is so much overlap there. Um, and there is so much unexplored overlap there. So for example, I think um, with the, with the static shape checking, I think that there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of interesting overlap with the PLs, PLs world there because originally we actually intended um, for that to be in the type checker, um, but mm -hmm. there's we can't extend Kotlin in in that direction. We actually ended up we actually started hacking the compiler at first, um, and our first prototype was actually just in the shape or in the type checker. So I, I would say like. So it's kind of interesting to to see how PLs and PL and ML fit together here, especially with that sp specific feature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I guess it's a trade off of having the neat sort of clean compiler plugins versus having your own branch of Kotlin, which makes it harder yeah. to use. Yeah. Yeah, I would say we we kind of went in that direction because it was hard to maintain and make sure that everything was up to date with upstream as well. Um, but yeah, but the compiler plugins are really nice as well. And we're working with JetBrains on the usability. Oh, okay. So can you um, maybe put your, your work in context of the wider research uh, uh, industry um, ecosystem? I think there's, there was a, there was, unfortunately, a project called Swift for TensorFlow, which I think is related to what you're doing in a way. But for the Swift language, are there mm -hmm. others that we might want to watch while we wait for you to open source this? <laughs> yeah, um, there's other there's other ones. Um, of course, there's PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Jax, which are very popular. Um, other than that, there's also Julia, which has Zygote, and I'm I'm not sure if they have what the other name was, but they have a uh, differentiation with in Julia as well. In is, it, is Julia as extensible as Kotlin? I can't remember Do they use macros um, or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know that it's not statically compiled. It's actually, I guess, kind of between, well, in terms of types, it's kind of between static and dynamic typing, mm -hmm. but um, it's not statically compiled, so there isn't, there wouldn't be like a compiler plugin um, mm -hmm. infrastructure. And so, if you're looking at something like uh, PyTorch or I think Keras, mm -hmm. are those kind of the same way where you can write models in a language and then to figure out the, the graphs? Is that right, or is it a different thing? Yeah, yeah. So Keras is a um, so uh, yeah, Keras is a um, layer or a machine learning library on top of TensorFlow. So mm -hmm. it's a high level library, and so that that is a little bit different from PyTorch. Um, but Keras, sorry, what was your your question? I was just wondering if there's other tools that that are uh, similar to to the the work that you're doing with allowing people to write models in a language rather than plugging graphs together. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say Julia is probably the, the most similar one. I would say PyTorch. PyTorch is, PyTorch is really um, easy to use because it's, um, because you're not 
meta programming, whereas in TensorFlow, you are meta programming and you kind of have to think about how the actual graphs that you are building. So for example, instead of just having like a variable, you would have a variable node that you're updating. Um, so it, it, you there's this level of separation with TensorFlow. Um, but I think, yeah, and Keras is a, is a library on top of that. And so there's also um, this, there's also like a degree of separation too, because it's a high level library on top of TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. What used to be in the olden days, you had to literally plug together a graph, which was kind of, if you read the old TensorFlow examples, it was like, my Jesus, I have to do 20 pages of code just to have one network and something. So I think yeah. these language-based approaches are just neater, but cleaner. Yeah. So I'm just quickly, we're running out of time. I think we covered most things. There's a question about, is someone going to do a version of this talk oriented to math educators? Um, I don't think we can answer that. No, um, I mean, no, nothing planned, maybe one day. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, um, so I'm wrapping up. Um, thank you, Irene, again for your talk. Uh, everyone, uh, I think Irene, if you have time, could you join the Q and A? Right, uh, sorry, the the hangout right after this. Um, sure. Yeah, I'll be and, there. Cool. If people have questions, um, don't be shy. Um, come along and ask some questions right there. Um, the link is, I think, right under this talk. It's called Hangouts. You join right there. And with that, I think we can end. And thank you, Irene. All right. Thanks so much. <laughs>